Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings here on Now TV. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. I just really, really appreciate you being with me and hope your new year is going fantastic. Boy, you know, here we are. <laughs> January is almost already gone. When I was a young man, I used to hear, um, hear adults, older people, say, man, the older I get, the faster time flies. And I just didn't understand that. You know, when you're a, when you're a kid, you can't wait to be a teenager. Boy, the, the time just creeps along. You get 13. Oh, wait, man, I can't wait to be 16. Get my driver's license. It just never comes. It never comes. Well, you get your driver's license. Uh, but then you need to be 25 to get your insurance rates down. Uh, and that boy from 16 to 25 is just, just never, never, ever, ever going to get there. Certainly didn't in my case. It just seemed that way. And, you know, so there, there are these uh, points of time in our life where we're always looking forward to that next critical, crucial um, pillar, so to speak. And time just can't pass fast enough. And then... Then you kind of get to a certain point and you're going, um, wow, time sure is going fast. I just turned 73, December 31st. Uh, by the way, thank, thank you to all of those who, of you who wish me a happy birthday. And I'm one of those people that never thought I'd live to be 50 years old, much less 73 now, I am glad to say, okay, that just before my birthday, I was in a cup, I was in actually in two different separate businesses, and I mentioned that my birthday was coming up. And in both places, I asked him, I said, Well, how old do you think I am? And in one place, there was a group of five people standing around, and every one of them said, Well, you're probably around 60. And I just wanted to do a group hug. <laughs> Uh, I said, no, 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 I'm seven, I'll be turning 73. And they were incredulous. They said, no. And the same thing happened in the other place. That individual, actually, there were two individuals in that other place, and they both said, well, we would estimate you to be 62, 63. And I said, well, no, I'm, I'll be turning 73. They, too, were incredulous. So I, I'm glad to say that at least in the eyes of some people, uh, I don't look 73 years old. I hope I don't act 73 years old. Uh, they all they all commented on how active and vibrant and enthusiastic I seem to be about life. And I told all of them, I said, you know what? I am active. I am enthusiastic. I am having the time of my life. I love my ministry. I do all of these videos teaching about God and about the Bible and about the promises of God. And I said, I'm reaching people all around the world. I am having an absolute blast. <laughs> so all of that said, to thank you again for being with me here on Now TV. I do appreciate it. Now then, we have been involved in a study. We are involved in a study of the challenge of Christ. Jesus said, John chapter 10, verse 37, if I do not do the works which my Father has given me, do not believe me. One of the works that Jesus was given by the Father, he certainly didn't just think it, think it up by himself in any kind of opposition to the Father. I had one detractor not long ago say, well, yeah, the father gave him the task of being raised from the dead, raising himself from the dead. And in fact, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 18, um, speaking of his life, he said, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power, and it's from the Greek word exousia, meaning authority, not only power, but authority to take it up again. No man takes it from me. So this detractor said, well, yeah, uh, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then we're not supposed to believe him because 
Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 12 and following, if Christ is not raised, then our faith is in vain. We are found to be false witnesses and we're still in our sin. But they said, it's different with the coming of Christ. That was not anything the Father gave him to do. And I'm going, say what? Uh, argumentum ad desperatum. So anyway, the challenge of Christ is that he said he was going to come back in flaming fire with the angels in the judgment of all men in the first century. And atheists, agnostics, skeptics, Jews, Muslims, all tell us, well, it's obvious he didn't do it, therefore he failed. Now, I don't know if it's going to take place or not, and by the time this particular program airs, it may possibly have been taken place, or may have already taken place. Uh, and if it if it does, then I'll certainly inform you in another uh, in another video. But we are in the process of trying to set up a formal YouTube or uh, internet debate between myself and a former Church of Christ minister who left the faith, abandoned all hope, and has written a book entitled Broken Promises. Mark Davis is his name. Now, I was approached here a good little while back, actually before, before the first year, before the holidays, by an individual who, who was once a believer himself. He's abandoned that. And asked me if I would be willing to debate Mr. Davis, and I said, certainly I would. If his premise is Jesus promised to return in the first century and he didn't do it, therefore he, he's not the Son of God, the Bible is false. If that's his premise, is that if that's his reason for abandoning his faith, guess what? I'm all in. Set the debate up. So I contacted him day before yesterday, that is, this uh, blogger who does this internet radio show, and I said, are we going to do the debate in January as you promised? Well, he'd obviously forgotten about it, so he said he'd reach out to the guy, Mr. Davis, and see about it. I've scanned and looked at enough of Mr. Davis's book, and again, Promises Broken, or Broken Promises, to know that he takes the very, very typical futurist view atheist view, and that is that Jesus promised to come back literally, visibly, bodily, as a five-foot-five Jewish man at the so-called end of time. Well, obviously, that didn't happen in the first century. I freely acknowledge Jesus did not come back literally, visibly, physically, bodily, and bring about the destruction of material cosmos in the first century. Anybody knows that, right? The problem, you see, is that concept of the coming of the Lord, as I've been sharing with you on, on Now TV for two years now, that concept of the coming of the Lord is a false concept. Jesus said he was going to come in the glory of the Father, which meant he was going to come as the Father had come in the past. Now, I hope this debate takes place with Mr. Davis. I'm very eager for it to take place. We will see if it does. And again, possibility, I don't know, but it's a possibility that by the time this program airs, that debate will, will already have taken place. Uh, if it does, I will be posting a link to it on my websites. I will be announcing it, and it will be aired on my YouTube video uh, channel. And so be watching for that. So in the meantime, I've been sharing with you that the book of Revelation, to which everybody wants to seems to want to go to talk about our yet future coming of the Lord, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. We talked about the language of eminence. <coughs> 
But in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3, blessed is he who reads, who understands, and who keeps the sayings of this book because the time has drawn near. And the word time there is kairos. I've been sharing with you for several months now the significance of this word kairos. Now, in an upcoming book, okay, entitled Resurrection Feast Fulfilled, and Lord willing, it won't be too much longer. Uh, the people that have been doing my editing, the people that have been generating my uh, scripture ind indices and my bibliography, they say they're done. In fact, uh, as I film this today, okay, as I film this today, and it's January the 12th when I'm filming this, I am due to have a rather lengthy conversation with this individual about my indices, and he has a bunch of questions and about this and that and the other. So keep this in your heart, keep this in your mind, keep it in your prayers, that the manuscript will be finished this week. Once it is finished, I will be submitting it to the publisher. I am so eager to get this book finished. I love it. I believe this material is dynamite. It, it is a fantastic companion to my latest book, Temple to Tell Us, uh, which is volume five. Volume four is the one that hasn't been published yet. Volume five of my series on Torah to Tell Us. So again, be watching for that. I think you're going to love it. It's a major book over 450 pages long. So in that book, I have a major study of the Greek word kairos, designated as a divinely appointed time. I've shared with you, okay, in the New Testament, what do we have? Over and over and over again, we have Jesus and the New Testament writers telling us the time has come. They tell us, for instance, in the book of Mark, Jesus came saying, repent, the time is fulfilled. The time, the kairos. F.F. Bruce in his little book, Time is Fulfilled, makes comment on that passage, Mark 1, 15, and a parallel in Mark chapter 4 and Matthew 4, 7, 4 17. And F.F. F. Bruce points out that when Jesus used the word, the time is fulfilled, and he, he was saying that a divinely appointed time, a, a prophetic time that had been given in the Old Testament, which had never been present in the Old Testament, Jesus was saying that that now designated, that that designated time had 2,000 years ago arrived. It was once not present, but now in the first century, it was present. And he points out, almost assuredly, that prophesied time, that prophesied kairos, was the book of Daniel. I think he's absolutely correct, because you see, no other book in all of the Old Testament, <clears throat> no other book gives us a time frame that is anywhere near as accurate, anywhere near, as, and I won't use the word explicit because that would give the indication of day and hour. Okay. But nowhere in the Old Testament do we find a book that is so full of references and predictions of an, of an appointed time of the end, as does the book of Daniel. So I've been spending a good bit of time sharing with you Daniel chapter 2, a vision of four world empires that were going to come, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar, going all the way to the days of Rome. And it would be in the days of Rome. Listen, folks, if you don't catch this, please focus. Please pay attention. Please catch the power of this. It would be in the days of Rome that the God of heaven would set up a kingdom which would never be destroyed. Not a revived Roman Empire, 
I've had people on the internet just this week tell me, well, you know, uh, the Bible talks about a twofold period of the last days. One that began in AD 70, the other that will end at the end of time, at the end of the Roman Empire, at the end of the second Roman dispersion. Folks, there is no second Roman dispersion. There is no second Roman captivity. That is a contrived theological invention that has no exegetical support. So Daniel chapter 2 set the appointed, designated, divinely appointed time for the establishment of the kingdom as the days of the Roman Empire. We spent a good bit of time on that. Point number two, Daniel chapter 7, a passage that we've spent a good bit of time on, parallel to Daniel chapter 2, beginning in the days of Belshazzar, going to the days of Rome. Four kingdoms from Babylon to Rome. And in the days of Rome, the little horn would arise, persecute the saints, be destroyed at the coming of the one like the Son of Man. You know, just this morning, it's so very common. It's a view I used to hold myself. An individual was posting on the internet that Daniel 7, 13, and 14 was a prediction of the ascension of Christ. No, it's not. Again, I used to believe that, but it doesn't work. Why? Because Daniel chapter 7, 1 to 12, was a prediction of the flow, the narrative, all the way down to the fourth empire. And in the days of that empire, the little horn would arise, persecute the saints, and thrones were set, judgment was set, and the little horn came, or excuse me, uh, the son of man came. What did the son of man come to do? To destroy the little horn. Well, guess what? That's not the ascension. But it, was, it would be in the days of that fourth empire, the Son of Man would come as the Ancient of Days in destruction of the little horn. And again, ladies and gentlemen, we are not talking about a revived Roman Empire here. There is no such doctrine in the Bible. In the days of Rome, Rome ceased to exist in 476 B.C. So the coming of the Lord, the judgment, the kingdom is absolutely confined to the days of Rome. And technically, earlier than 476, because Jesus came saying the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. 476 is 400 years away. That's not at hand. That's not near. That's not quickly. That's not shortly. And I've got to hurry here. So we closed out last week trying to offer our concluding thoughts on Daniel chapter 7 as predicting the appointed time of the end. Folks, there is no prophecy of the appointed time of the end of Daniel 7 beyond the first century and beyond the days of Rome. It's not there. The next passage that we want to go through, go to and spend time on is one of the most important of all Old Covenant passages and prophecies. In fact, John Walvoord, who passed away, you know, some time ago now, said that Daniel chapter 9, 24 and following, is the most important of all Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah. I'm not so sure, but what he was right. Very first time I read his quote, I'm going, yeah, yeah, I'm not really sure about that. But the more I've studied, the more I'm almost convinced that he's right on that. Why is Daniel 9 so critically important? It is so critically important because Israel was taken off into Babylonian captivity. Daniel 9, and they were supposed to, according to Jeremiah chapter 29, 10 and following, they were supposed to spend 70 years 
in Babylonian captivity. At the end of the Babylonian captivity, they were supposed to be returned to their land. Daniel was one of the captives from Jerusalem taken off into Babylonian captivity. So Daniel was reading the prophet Jeremiah, and he came to understand the time. He came to understand that the time, the 70 years, was basically up. And so he prayed to the Lord to find out when they're going to be delivered. And Daniel 9, and scholars are agreed on this, by the way, Daniel 9 is what is known as a Reb Todeh prayer. A Reb Todeh prayer in the ancient Hebrew followed a certain structure, a certain pattern, a certain outline, if you please. I'm not going to go into detail uh, to explain all of that. But I do want to notice down here, we'll begin with Daniel chapter 9, verse 9, and read a little bit. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Now, part of the Reb Todeh prayer was to acknowledge the greatness, the glory, the mercy, and the compassion of God, the fairness, the justice of God. So here is Daniel acknowledging that, and he says, <clears throat> we, Daniel is speaking collectively here of Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Notice how Daniel is equating the law with the prophets. Do you catch that? That's really, really important. The prophets have set before us the law of God. <clears throat> they are representatives of the law. I would say this. The prophets were the conscience of the law. But to continue. Yes, <clears throat> pardon me. All Israel has, has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us. Now, please pay attention to this. By bringing upon us great disaster for under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works we is, which he has done, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made himself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins, for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are, are a reproach to all of those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplication before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O Lord, hear, O Lord, 
and forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my Lord, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. So, here is Daniel in recognition of the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 27. You, you can throw Jeremiah chapter 25 in there as well. But the point of it is, Jeremiah had foretold not only the destruction of Jerusalem, not only the Babylonian captivity, but that the captivity would last for 70 years. So here is Daniel. He understands that the 70 years are basically up, yet they have not been delivered. So he engages in that Reb Todei prayer, acknowledging the righteousness of God, acknowledging Israel's sin, acknowledging the justice of God in punishing them, asking for the Lord's mercy and forgiveness of them, asking for the Lord to remember his covenant and to return them based upon their forgiveness, based upon their repentance and their forgiveness. So then in verse 20 and following, what do we have? As he was praying, let's just continue, and I'm spending time with this so that we can understand the real context. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people in Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand at the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. And what follows is Daniel 9, 24 to 27, one of the greatest prophecies in all the Bible. It demands that we pay attention to God's appointed time. We will pick up on this next week. See you then.